Hey guys, it's Cody here with Fiveable. I'm so glad that you decided to join us tonight. Tonight we are talking about air pollution. Air pollution is all around us, um, from bonfires to factories to even fast food restaurants and other restaurant chains that are cooking and producing smoke and other kind of pollutants that might enter the air. All right, so before we actually start talking about air pollution, be sure to follow Think Fiveable on Twitter. Instagram and YouTube to stay up to date on all the resources that are coming out. We've been, us creators have been working around the clock to get those to you guys. So um, be sure to check those out and also find out when any other live streams are coming up. All right. So in today's live stream, we're going to be talking about coal and fuel, foss fossil fuel combustion, acid rain, the Clean Air Act, smog thermal inversion, and reducing air pollution. Um, how do you guys feel on these topics? Let me know in the chat if you like as we go along, and if you like which one that you're the least confident in out of those um, six. And they'll also be practiced at the end of the live stream. All right, so coal combustion. As many of you guys probably know, coal is typically burned for energy um, or heat. Um, in a factory, they might burn it for energy to keep things going. Um, they might burn it for heat. All these um, different uses that um, coal has. So the main chemicals that are released when coal is burned um, are carbon dioxide, which is CO2, sulfur dioxide, which is SO2, um, particulate matter, um, and we'll get more into that later as it relates to sulfur. Um, and toxic metals such as lead and mercury. So one thing that I want to stress to you guys is um, understanding not only the chemicals that might be released, but some of the chemicals and chemical formulas, because um, those can be very important when we're looking at how these air pollutants, air pollutants change over time. So we see down here, uh, or as you see down in the lower part of the side, um, sulfur dioxide. Um, sulfur dioxide is a primary pollutant. So what that means is that when carbon is burned, it's released into the atmosphere. It's primary. That's what the pollutant is, is sulfur dioxide. Now, sulfur dioxide becomes aerosols in the atmosphere once it starts reacting with all these different chemicals that are already present in the atmosphere. Um, and I defined aerosols down there in case you guys didn't know what it means. Um, basically, an aerosol is like suspended particles in the air. So, looking at the two beneath it, sulfate would probably be more of an aerosol because there are little particles of sulfate floating throughout the atmosphere. And that's how I think, that's how what aerosols are. We have little tiny particulate matter that's sort of kind of just floating around in the atmosphere. Um, so, sulfur dioxide can turn into one of many things, but the two listed below are sulfuric acid and sulfate. Um, we talked about sulfate becoming a particulate, um, but it can also contribute to acid rain. Whenever the sulfur gets into the atmosphere, it starts reacting with a lot of different chemicals, which is something that happens a lot. So we go from sulfur dioxide, which is SO2, and then we see this conversion between um, SO2 and H2SO4, which creates acid rain. Uh, both of these pollutants that form with the sulfur dioxide are secondary pollutants. So we have a primary pollutant, and then once a reaction happens, it becomes a whole new pollutant, and that means that it's secondary. That's something that I that's really important that you guys identify is whether it's a primary pollutant or a secondary pollutant. And I saw while I was talking, a few more people joined. So if you want to, let me know how you guys are feeling about air pollution in the chat and any topics you would like me to cover. All right, so there are a few more gases that are released when carbon dioxide is burned. One of which is carbon dioxide, which again is a primary pollutant. The problem with carbon dioxide and why it is primarily a pollutant is due to the fact that it's a greenhouse gas. A greenhouse gas is a gas that goes into the atmosphere, absorbs heat, and then basically resorbs heat. I put and then releases it, but that's not always the case. Um, 
I mean, I guess it is because that's why it's warm whenever it releases heat. But primarily, it absorbs heat, uh, absorbs heat, and keeps the 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 um, keeps the troposphere warm. Is basically what happens when greenhouse gases go into the atmosphere, which causes climate change. So keeping uh, carbon dioxide minimal is pretty important. Um, carbon monoxide is also a problem, but not for the same reasons. Carbon monoxide is more of a personal health um, problem because breathing in carbon monoxide negatively impacts the blood's ability to carry oxygen. So as you guys might have noticed as going through the course, it's a little contradictory how we're making these pollutants and right now we're studying how they affect the environment, but also there are impacts that negatively impact us. So that might be a reason that that's one of the reasons why we need to reduce the pollutants that we release into the atmosphere. And finally, unburned carbon, which is soot. Um, you guys have probably seen soot before, um, whether in real life or in movies and stuff, you know, when there's fire and the person's covered in, uh, like little black dust type things, that's soot. And basically soot is when carbon doesn't burn. All It doesn't burn. Um, and one thing that this does is it adds to smog. If you've seen smog before or you've seen a picture of it, then you know it has a dark gray color to it. And that's uh, partially due to smog. Uh, one thing that I will, that is important here is China relies heavily on coal for energy. And as you guys might have learned in class, China has a lot of smog and a lot of air pollution. So we sort of kind of see that connection between coal use and smog slash other air pollution. All right, fossil fuel combustion. Um, fossil fuels are primarily burned in vehicles, um, used for heat generation, electricity, all these different kinds of things um, are... Uh, pollution produced, pollution, air pollution pollutants produced includes nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and hydrocarbons. So the main one that I think you guys should remember for this, I mean, you should remember all of them, but if you don't remember all of them, the one, the ones I would remember is nitrogen oxides, which is a primary pollutant. It's nitrogen oxides, or just remember not nitrogen oxide, which is just NL. So from uh, these nitrogen oxides, a lot of different chemical reactions occur. And we'll talk about this more when we get to acid, acid rain and photochemical smog. But here's um, just a little bit about it. Um, so basically, nitrogen oxides can take two paths. We can, it can either turn into nitric acid, which is HNO3, or a nitrate salt, which is NO3 negative. So out of those two that I just mentioned, nitric acid and nitrate salts, which would you think are particulates or aerosols? Let me know in the chat real quick. If you like. Think, remember, aerosols are like particles in the air, really, really small particles. So I remember it. All right, it would be nitrate salts. Um, they're little tiny particles that are floating around in the atmosphere. Now, both of these are secondary. Meaning again, they they are not originally what was released into the atmosphere, but they were a result of chemical reactions that happened in the atmosphere. And one of the biggest things about nitrogen oxide is acid rain. That is so important is acid rain and the impact that nitrogen oxides play in that. Um, and that's ma mainly it's the um, nitric acid that is playing that is playing the role there. And acid rain. And from this, uh, we see the decreased growth of vegetation because as acid rain comes down on plants of vegetation, the uh, pH of soil increases, which might make it inhabitable for some vegetation. And also, this is a major contributor to smog, and we'll talk about that later. Um, we see respiratory issues and eye irritation. Um, the respiratory issues are most likely due to its role in smog. Um, it's one of the main 
molecules that causes that chemical reaction to occur. Um, and as you can see down here, um, it is also a big contributor to ozone. We see the NO3 um, with um, UV radiation energy is becoming nit nitrogen oxide and oxygen. And then this oxygen that is formed here becomes oxygen and O2, or it becomes oxygen and reacts with an O2 to make O3, which in turn is ozone. All right, acid rain. So the once again, just to recap a little bit, so we have sulfate, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid. These um, little molecules of these acids are mixing in with rain and in turn making it more acidic and lowering the pH. Um, examples of the impacts are corrosion of statues and buildings. Uh, if you guys haven't seen that before, I suggest you look it up. But essentially, if you've seen a stone, stone statue and they're sort of kind of like, uh, there's like black streaks down it, sometimes that can be acid rain. But basically, they just cause corrosion to statues and buildings, particularly stone, if they're made of stone. Um, increased pH in bodies of water, resulting in the inability of organisms to live in that body of water. Um, increased pH in the soil is a big one because not only are we talking about plants being impacted, we're talking about the water system being impacted because of runoff. And if the soil quality goes down, um, especially if we're in an area that is heavily reliant on farming, then we could see negative impacts there. Which So basically, acid rain has a big widespread impact across many different facets of the of humanity, I guess you could call it. Um, the effects are widespread geographically because of wind. If you've ever seen a smokestack, um, they are blowing smoke into the air and the wind carries it. All the wind currents um, at high altitudes are, current, are carrying these pollutants elsewhere and then they come down as acid rain. And the effects are different by region. So um, say for example, in New York City, we have a lot of air pollution and then it goes somewhere in nearby that's more farm-based. Well, it's gonna have a different impact in New York City itself because acid rain might damage a building or um, lower the pH like very slightly of the Hudson River. However, if we go to a place that's more reliant on farming, then we might see soil, more soil degradation and vegetation um, disruption. Any questions, please let me know in the chat. I'd be happy to answer any of them. Any concerns, anything, just let me know. All right, so the Clean Air Act. I'm hoping that all of you guys have heard of this, but if not, I'm about to tell you about it. So this, the Clean Air Act was passed in 1963 by the Environmental Protection Agency. And essentially in the most, in its most general form, the act was created to protect the air we breathe, set some standards and find ways that we can clean up our air. So some of the things they did, um, we see vehicle emission, emissions standards start to come into place. We're limiting how much vehicles can emit. And we see, um, actually from this, we see things such as the catalytic converter. If you guys have heard of that, that's placed in cars to help meet these standards. And we'll talk about that later. Um, stack height, which is referring to smokestack. So how high are we going to allow smokestacks to be in the air. And that's a big one because like we discussed before, wind currents can carry these plumes very far. And I think another important thing is that it identifies some of, some of the air plumes. Um, so we're really sort, sort of, we're really focusing on what the problem is. What different kind of pollutants do we need to focus on to make our air cleaner? Um, we also see ozone protection identified. Um, other sections of the law include prevention of significant deterioration of air quality, and that sort of kind of just lays out 
all right, so how are we going to prevent our air from being dirty and not as effective as it should be? And then um, the plan requirements for non-attainment areas, and that's mainly things like on the road. Like on the interstate, there's a lot of air pollution, but how are we going to help that? How are we going to prevent air pollution from that? And yeah, both laid out ways to keep the air clean. And another thing that I was looking through the CED, which tells, um, tells students and teachers what you guys need what you guys need to learn for the exam and they mentioned the lead a lot so here's a little bit about that um the clean air act did a lot to reduce the amount of lead in the atmosphere um one of one of the main ways is they set regulations for the use of lead in gasoline um and the, it actually led to the concentration of lead in the atmosphere to decrease by 80%, which is a lot. And that happened with a lot of different air pollutants. Once we had this idea of, all right, so we're reducing these air pollutants, this is sort of kind of how we're gonna do it. Here's what the problem is. Here's how we're fixing it. We sort of kind of see the air pollutants sort of kind of the concentration decrease. Um, I was reading a statistic and I think it was um, over like millions of IQ points were actually saved in children because of this because lead can um, negatively impact um, development of children. So by not having all the sun in the atmosphere, um, children are able to develop more or better, I should say. All right, any questions about the Clean Air Act? No, I'm guessing not. All right, so photochemical smog. I mentioned this a couple of times in the live stream, but photochemical smog um, is basically when nitrogen oxides hydro and hydrocarbons and volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere react in various ways to produce a lot of pollutants. So a lot of these are going to be secondary pollutants from primary pollutants. And I put a little chemical equation. It's not, it doesn't have a lot of chemicals in it, but it has VOCs plus NO, I'm pretty sure that's an X, heat and sunlight and smog, or, or create smog. So that's basically what's happening here. We're having volatile organic compounds, nitrogen oxides, heat, UV radiation, sunlight, and it's causing these reactions to occur, which creates smog. Vol volatile organic compounds are compounds that evaporate under normal atmospheric conditions. So like room temperature, normal pressure, and they have the ability to evaporate. This is negative because now we have these chemicals that are now in the atmosphere. Um, they include chemicals and gas, acetone, solvents, formaldehyde, and some of these are actually in, that you guys probably have in your home like the alcohol and cleaning supplies is actually one of these VOCs. Um, nitrogen oxide happen, or smog happens in three main stages, but there's a lot of stages that happen outside of it. Um, and one thing I want you to remember, as I start to go through these chemical, the chemical reactions that happen, really remember that UV radiation, heat, and sunlight are the things that are causing this to, um, causing UV and radiation is what's causing these reactions to occur. And finally, on this slide, I put can cause health issues. So I'm pretty sure all of you guys know about the coronavirus by now. Um, if you don't, um, it was a big thing in China and it's now spread to a majority of the world. But basically, a lot of people say that the air pollution in China made the disease worse or virus worse for people that had it and made the symptoms worse. So that sort of kind of falls under health issues. Um, by breathing in a lot of smoke and smog, um, you have respiratory issues that can occur. Um, there are, it might worsen, like if you have the flu or pneumonia where it might be harder to breathe, this is making it worse. So we see a lot of agitation of respiratory diseases. All right, so here are the chemicals. Here I have four stages, but 
it's okay. So the first stage, if we think about this, we're kind of in a timeline. It's the morning, and uh, er everyone's going to work. All the cars are running and putting their air pollution into the atmosphere. And we see the chemical um, N2 being released as part of the emissions from the vehicles. Excuse me. So once this N2 gets into the atmosphere, we have some UV radiation just starting to come out, starting to get some, uh, starting to get some chemical reactions happening, and now we have two nit or we have nitrogen oxide in the atmosphere. So really quickly, what is a primary pollutant in the first stage? The primary pollutant, what is being put into the atmosphere? And what is the secondary pollutant? Don't be shy to answer. Anybody? All right. So, so the primary pollutant here is N2. Um, that's what's being released into the atmosphere. And the secondary pollutant is NO, nit or nitrogen oxide. That is the secondary pollutant. So now we have nit nitrogen oxide is now free floating in the atmosphere and it reacts with O2 again. And from here we see the creation of NO2. Um, I'm not sure of the chemical name of that. If anyone knows it, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, but now from here, it's sort of kind of like steps. So we make one part and now we made another one. So now NO2 becomes NO plus O. Nitrogen oxide plus oxygen. And then the final fourth stage, we have um, we have O2 plus uh, plus one singular oxygen makes O3, which is ozone. And ozone is one of the major greenhouse gas greenhouse gases. No, it's not greenhouse gas. Never mind. But ozone is one of yeah, it is. Hold on. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is that holds in heat. So these are the different chemical reactions that are happening to make photochemical smog. So you might be like, oh, so photochemical smog is all ozone. Not necessarily. All these different chemicals are just floating around, mixing, mixing, reacting all at the same time. And something important that I wanted to notice, wanted, wanted to point out, is that this fourth stage happens in reverse sometimes. So once it starts to cool, cool down a little bit, we might see O3 become O and O2, and, and then, and vice versa. At the Not at the same time, but happen within time, within a close time frame. All right. Thermal inversion. Thermal inversion occurs when higher altitudes have warmer temperatures than lower altitudes. So if you guys, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but typically a temperature gradient in an atmosphere goes from high temperature to lower temperatures as you get higher, exception the ozone layer because it holds in heat. But that's typically how it goes in the troposphere. As you go higher, it gets colder. However, this is not the case in thermal inversion. If you think inversion, we're inverting it. So now the higher temperatures are at higher altitudes and the lower temperature is at lower altitudes, which is not normal. Um, basically what happens in this, so we have cold, cold air, hot air, and cold air above it. So whenever we're thinking about thermal inversion, we have this warm air that's trapping this cold air beneath it. So in turn, if we're trapping this cold air, then the air balloons are also getting trapped um, closer to the ground. And this is something that is um, def definitely impacts photochemical smog because we have all these pollutants from cars and 
factories and just city the, from a city in general, and now it's being trapped closer to the ground. And we see um, an increase of impacts. Um, if you guys were wondering, a thermal inversion occurs when a warmer air mass moves over a cold one or colder. One. All right, any questions? Don't be afraid to ask. I'm here to answer them. Um, we're entering our last section, and then we're going to have some practice questions. So any questions that you guys have, I'd be happy to answer. All right. And even don't be afraid to ask while I'm talking, and I'll um, look over and read it and answer it if I can. All right. So um, vapory, these are methods of reducing air pollution. Um, once the EPA comes out with the Clean Air Act, we're seeing these methods start to come about and they're more prominent because we're meeting certain standards that the Clean Air Act sets and all these different things. So the first one I have here is a vapor recovery nozzle. If any of you guys pump your own gas or um, do it for your parents, then you guys have probably used one of these before. Basically what happens is at a gas pump, they're used at a gas pump, and what they do is they capture the vapor from the gas from escaping from the automobile's gas tank. This is important because gas, like we mentioned before, has a lot of toxic fumes. And once, um, I'm trying to think, once the vapor is captured, it's returned back to the storage tank at the gas station, and it's just a cycle that keeps going. Um, over and over again. Um, we did actually get a question, where would thermal inversion typically happen? Um, I would think probably in a mountainous area, if you think about it, because if you're in a valley and you have cold air in the valley and then warm air comes in over it, um, that's how I would think of it typically done and isn't typically would occur in the mountains. I hope that help answers your question. All right, so catalytic converters. Um, these are actually part in your car that help to reduce uh, car emissions. Um, these were put in cars primarily to meet the standards set by the EPA on car emissions. So here's how I remember it. Catalytic converter converts harmful pollutants into less harmful ones. Whenever you're burning gasoline, which is full of all these different kinds of chemicals, a lot of harmful pollutants are created, and that's a big negative impact on the environment. So this catalytic converter helps to change them into less harmful pollutants. I'm not saying they're not harmful, but they're less harmful. So that's um, those are two ways that um, we have found to keep the air pollution from vehicle use down. Now these last few are primarily used in factories and uh, factories, I'm trying to think what else, like coal plants and other stuff like that. You're not gonna probably find this small scale. I wanna think they're more large scale. So wet scrubbers are very effective um, at removing pollutants. Um, they're one of the most effective ways. They basically use liquid to remove pollutants from the air. Um, but there are some negative sort of kind of consequences, I guess you could say, of using this. It releases two different things into the atmosphere, steam and wastewater. Now, this wastewater might have to be filtered because if it has pollutants or something in there, then we can't just really set back to the environment because we just defeated the purpose of having a wet scrubber clean the air. So that's something that to sort of kind of think about when you're thinking about wet scrubbers and how they clean the air is thinking, all right, so they have a byproduct, which is wastewater and steam. And the steam might also have a few pollutants in it, but that's um, highly unlikely because they're very effective. All right, dry scrubbers. Dry sc scrubbers, air pollutants are captured as they move through a gas. And this is usually used whenever a factory or something doesn't have 
the facility to deal with wastewater. So um, there's really, you just cleaning out a filter is primarily the only like maintenance I guess you have to do on it. But it's, it's not as effective as a dry scrubber or I mean, a, as a wet scrubber, um, definitely not as effective. Um, and finally, electrostatic precipitators. Now this might sound really confusing. Like just based on the name, you're probably like, might be like a little intimidating, like, whoa, what's, what's going on? But it's really not that difficult. It basically uses static electricity to remove dust. That's all, that's it. That's all it does. So, um, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Removes dust from the air and other particulate and other particulates. Any questions? We're gonna move into some practice. I have about 10 practice questions, and then we'll be done for the night. All right, let's head into the practice. Um, feel free to answer any of these questions in the chat. Don't be afraid to answer the wrong thing. We're all learning. Oh, we have a question. Okay, thermal inversion a little bit more. I can definitely answer that. All right, so thermal inversion. Let me go back to that slide really quick. All right, thermal inversion. All right, sorry I wasn't able to get a picture of it on here. But if you imagine thermal inversion, think of a city in a valley, right? So we have a city in a valley. And now we have cold air setting over, setting in the valley. We have cold air. And then on the top, we have warmer air that's sort of kind of trapping the cold air in. Um, one way I heard it described is the warm air above the cold air isn't allowing the atmosphere to mix. So when chemicals are normally, um, or pollutants are normally put into the atmosphere, they mix in with everything. But this warm air is not allowing that to happen and is holding all of the pollutants in the cold air in the valley, which keeps it lower to the ground. So um, when we have the presence of photochemical smog or any pollutants, really, the warm mat air mass is almost like a bubble and it's trapping everything in. So any air pollution is being trapped in the bubble. Um, and yeah, so basically... Like I like I mentioned, higher altitude, so the higher up the higher up you go is warm, and we have this low and we have this um, cooler temperature at the bottom. And then we have a warm air bubble holding all of it in. Does that answer your question? Are there any specific, okay, so another question, are there any specific pollutants that are removed by each method by method of, all right, all right, yeah, so pollutant, the pollutant that is um, extracted using electrostatic precipitators is mainly dust and particles, because if you have ever used like a balloon, and you know how like you rub it against your hair, and like the um, little strands of hair attract to it, well, that's sort of kind of what I think of whenever I'm thinking of electrostatic is that, um, sorry, I can't see on my side, um, is basically this electrostatic precipitator is taking um, little particles from the air and dust primarily. That's what electrostatic precipitators are taking from the air. Um, wet scrubbers. If I'm remembering correctly, they're good at removing acid from the, um, it's either one of these scrubbers are good at removing acid from the atmosphere. And if I move this back, and then um, again, vapor recovery nozzle um, is gas fumes. And then a catalytic converter, I'm not exactly sure what chemo what air pollutants are being removed there. But um, yeah, so I'm not sure about that, but I know for the electrostatic, it's dust primarily. Yeah, all right. So any more questions? I'd be happy to answer them.
If not, then I'm going to move on to practice, but still feel free to ask me any questions. And you can also ask in the chat if you like. All right. So the first question, what secondary pollutants can be produced from burning coal? A, nitrogen oxide, B, sulfate dioxide, C, sulfuric acid, and D, hydrogen gas. In the chat, which one do you think is the right answer? All right. Anybody? Give you a few more seconds to uh, answer if you'd like. Actually, um, good try. But remember, sulfate dioxide is a primary pollutant. So the correct answer would be C, sulfuric acid. Do you understand? Do you understand why? Because so nitrogen oxide and sulfate dioxide are initial, initially released into the atmosphere. However, uh, sulfuric acid is prime is secondary because it's the sulfate dioxide become that turns into sulfuric acid through chemical reactions. Yep, sulfuric acid. All right. So, which of the following are aerosols? slash particles. Actually, Melanie, you're close. It's both A and C. Um, because nitrate, although I did only put the sulfate was an aerosol in the um, PowerPoint slides, nitrate salts can be considered aerosols because they're particles too. Just in case you didn't know that. And also, um, if you guys are confused on aerosols, I will look them up because I, even I was confused whenever I was making the PowerPoint and stuff like that on what aerosols what what aerosols were. So if you guys are confused on that, then I would look um, maybe look it up or um, ask your in, teacher, instructor, or something like or someone like that because um, it can be confused. Like, but from what I understood, it was um, like really tiny particles in the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, yeah, both A and C. So you were close, very close. All right. Well, you all know the answer, but, um, just for review, what causes soot, um, would be C, unburned carbon. Um, yeah. All right, unburned carbon. All right. So this one, I don't think we covered. Which season is the ozone most likely to be impacted due to photochemical smog? So which season is the ozone most, most likely to be impacted due to photochemical smog? Yes, B, yes. So um, the reason why is because ozone is, um, ozone is to be created is reliant a lot on UV rays. And so whenever, it's summer, there's a lot more heat and a lot more UV rays that is causing more ozone to be created. So good job there. All right, so here's some short answer questions. You don't, you don't have to answer anything long, just some, just a little as short as you would like. Um, for number five, are nitric oxides primary or secondary pollutants? And whenever I say not nitric oxides, I really mean nitric oxide. Just NO, primary or secondary? Maybe think back to the um, photochemical smog. Yep, primary. Um, we're thinking uh, coal here. We're thinking vehicles, burning fossil fuels, releasing into the air. All right, good job. So now we're on to number six. Try to list at least three things included in the Clean Air Act. All right. All right, so three things that were included in the AIR Act are um, smoke sack height. Um, we have car emission standards. Um, we're identifying what 
um, air pollutants or prop are basically what the different chemicals are that are air pollutants. Um, there was another one. Ozone protection. Um, uh, sort of kind of like a plan on how we're going to protect the air um, and all those different things. So seven, how might vegetation be impacted by acid rain? All right, so actually pH level decreases because if we think acid rain, right, low pH. So we're um, like lower than seven. So we're, it's actually lowering the pH. Um, but yes, yeah, soil can become uninhabitable. Um, plants die and water pH goes down. Um, any vegetation that might be um, getting water from these sources can be negatively impact, impacted. Eight, what are different methods of reducing air pollution? Um, wet and dry scrubbers, catalytic converters, electrostatic precipitators, all correct. Um, and also don't forget um, the vapor, vapor nozzle. I forgot the other, that one's hard to remember because it's long. Um, vapor collector nozzle or something like that. Um, but yes, all of those are correct. So nine, how does thermal inversion impact photochemical smog? Yes, that is right. Pollutants get trapped near the surface. And remember, if you're getting confused, think thermal inversion, the warm air is trapping the cold air and pollutants down to the ground. Yes, correct. So finally, number 10, what two chemicals contribute to acid rain? Close. So think about like what actual compounds, what different kinds of acids are um, contributing to acid rain. But that is right. Yes, correct. Sulfuric acid and nitric acid both come from sulfuric dioxide or sulfur, I mean sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. And they react in the atmosphere to produce sulfuric acid and nitric acid, which in turn come down as, as acid rain. All right, you guys did great in the practice. Um, here are the answers. Oh gosh, hold on. I just realized. Um, yeah, here are the answers to the questions. They're not numbered correctly, but there are the answers. So does anybody have any other questions? I would be happy to answer them. Um, anybody? Feel free to ask any questions. All right, well, you're welcome. I Believe me, I'm glad to uh, help you guys out. I'm glad that you learned a lot. Um, you're welcome. If there's anything that you got, any questions that you guys have, um, if you guys scroll down um, beneath the live stream and um, there's resources, um, a small summary and discuss. If you sign in, then you can join the discussion. And if you guys have any other questions that you guys think of in your class, um, then you can ask down there and I will try my best to answer it. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys learned a lot and I hope to see you in, an, in another live stream. Thank you.